Good morning, Your Honors. Tracy Cusick for the Commonwealth. Uh, Your Honors, this appeal is a primarily a procedural question as to the handling of a motion for stay of execution of sentence uh, in a case where the, a single justice of the appeals court has denied the motion for stay. Uh, this court later grants direct appellate review and the defendant seeks uh, further review of his request for a stay. Uh, in this case, the plain language of the rule uh, indicates that after a single justice has denied an application for stay, uh, the appeal of that is to uh, either the, a panel of the appeals court if the case is pending in the appeals court or the full bench of this court if the case is pending in so, this court. So you, you would say that what should happen now is that um, we should review what Judge Fecto did and not what uh, Judge Spina did? Yes, Your Honor. As a, as a practical matter, it will also tie into the direct appeal in this case. Um, no, I understand that, but, but you, you know, yes. that's, that's the single justice whose uh, who's, uh, action you say we should review. Yes. Now, Justice Spina, in his um, memo explaining why he decided to um, do as he did, um, focused on language in the rule which had to do with taking, um, with the appeal to be um, taken uh, the, um, the, he focused on the word taken in the rule rather than in the uh, court in which the appeal was pending. And he, he remarked that um, that kind of a focus would, pre would preclude a single justice of this court uh, from reviewing a case that had been taken from the appeals court, either sua sponte or by direct appellate review, um, to this court uh, before the appeals court single justice had ruled. And uh, in which case, if the taken language that you focus on um, were to be dispositive of how we construe the rule, that uh, there would be no possibility of um, uh, coming to a single justice. No, Your Honor. Um, in Justice Spina's opinion, he said, I believe, prior to a single justice of the appeals court having ruled, a single justice did rule. No, I understand that Not that's what happened here. But right. I mean, he was saying that he didn't think that your way of construing the rule was correct. No, Your Honor, I believe uh, the Commonwealth's method of construing the rule would be if, this, if the case were to be in this court and the defendant then sought review from a single justice, not having already sought that in the appeals court, here the, defendant, the defense controls the timing of the application for direct appellate <laughs> review. So if this court had taken the case uh, earlier prior to his going to a single justice of the appeals court, I would, not, I would believe he would be entitled to come to a single justice here. Because, because it would then be pending in this court. Uh, so certainly a defendant would always have uh, access to a single justice, be it of the appeals court or of this court. Would it make any difference if he had taken an appeal to the full bench of the appeals court of, the, of Justice Fecto's uh, decision um, prior to the time that it came here? I believe if he had gone to the full bench of the appeals court and they had uh, declined to grant him relief, I believe he the appellate process would be exhausted as to, as to that aspect. So then uh, presumably a 211.3 might be something procedurally available mm -hmm. to him. So that, that, this situation isn't exactly precluded by the rule. It, the, does the rule really speak to this situation? Uh, the rule, uh, it's not explicit as to this situation. It doesn't seem to have necessarily contemplated this situation. But this situation isn't particularly unique. We're, we're many cases get here by way of direct appellate review. So certainly it's not so unique that the rule shouldn't apply uh, to a situation such as this one. Now, I, if you look, I, mean, I guess the spirit of the rule appears to be we, don't, we, we want there to be one single justice, and then it wants to go up to the court that's going to ultimately <coughs> decide it. Is that your understanding of the purpose? That, that appears to be the, okay. my understanding of the but rule, yes. The problem is that that cuts both ways, because I understand you want it to be that it's only one. Uh, but then the review of, by us, you want to be abuse of discretion, which is a very deferential form of review uh, and defeats that second part, which is to have the court, which is ultimately going to be deciding the issue, who has a better understanding of the possibility of reversal, since the court's going to be the one deciding it, to be making that determination. So what do we do here? I mean, I mean 
We took the case after J Justice Fecto denied it. We take cases for a reason. Uh, what if we have a different view as to the possibility of reversal? Well, certainly this court could, if it were in front of the full bench, the motion, the appeal of Justice Fecto's denial of the stay of execution of sentence, certainly this court could reverse Justice Fecto. Okay, on saying he abused his discretion or simply saying we have a different view of the case? I, if this court had a different view, arguably it would be Justice Fecto abused his discretion. It would seem the full bench is entitled to review the denial of the stay by the single justice, uh, and certainly this court, if it felt a stay was warranted and the single justice should have granted it, could do so. And, and what does it mean to have an abuse of discretion with regard to the evaluation of the, of the likelihood or, or whether there's a, I forget the precise language, whether there is a, a reasonable possibility of a reversal? It, it's somewhat of a difficult question in the context where this court is taking something on direct appellate review and the single justice might not be aware of uh, this court's reasons for so doing. But I would suggest it would be if this court were to find that the single justice of the appeals court should have allowed the motion for stay, then this court would certainly be able to enter that and allow it. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Uh, I submit to this court that this issue is very simple. The, the plain reason for the change in the rule by this court was to end the practice which existed in criminal cases but did not exist in civil cases where an appeal is pending in the appeals court, a defendant could go to a single justice of the appeals court and failing relief there, even though the case was still pending, the underlying appeal was still pending in the appeals court, could come here to a single justice and get a de novo hearing. I myself took advantage of that on many occasions. In the Ashford versus MBTA case, this court pointed out specifically that this is something that exists in, that we will not allow this in civil cases. And I think when the, when the, uh, the court uh, gets around to its rules, it says we're going to have the same thing in criminal cases. In a case where the appeal is pending in the appeals court, you don't get two single justice de novo applications, two, two de novo bites at the apple. That's all it is. And all the, all the rule means is that you go to a single justice of the court which has the appeal. And that is entirely consistent with the structure of the appellate practice uh, in this state. When you take a case from the appeals court, you, take, you, you basically review the, the trial court. You don't review what the appeals court did. You don't review the review. You don't review the appeals court review. You uh, review directly what the superior court did. Uh, it essentially wipes out <clears throat> what, the, uh, what the appeals court did. Uh, but you said this is to prevent two de novo bites of the apple, but isn't that what you got? Uh, so this it's rule, to pre rule prevent design. two de novo <clears throat> bites at the apple when the case is still pending in the appeals court, which is what the uh, civil uh, uh, plaintiff was trying to do in the Ashford case, and the court said, no, we don't allow that in civil cases. It may be allowed in, in criminal cases under all these uh, uh, Allen and other cases that that you uh, decided before. Uh, now, the, the, the power to grant a, uh, a stay is, is just a fundamental power uh, of an appellate court. And under the Commonwealth's theory, it really, and, uh, by extension of their logic, you just heard it here, <coughs> that you can that if this court took a case, if the uh, um, review in, uh, of the stay in the appeals court had been exhausted, that was it. You would be in a position where um, you might totally disagree with the appeals court, but sorry, uh, you took your appeal to the panel and you lost, or here, you, you, you didn't take an appeal. Uh, and the Commonwealth is, is, uh, is in the position of having to make up new procedures where they say, well, maybe a year after we fail to get relief from Justice Facto, well, we can take an appeal to the from the single justice of the appeals court to the full bench of this court. There's no such animal. It doesn't make 
uh, any common sense that that's what the that that's what the rule means. Now, uh, now, does the language of the rule presently permit your interpretation? Yes, it and, just and, says. And, 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 and how would it? An order by the single justice allowing or denying an application of state, no. Uh, I don't, <laughs> at this moment, Your Honor, I can't put my finger on the exact language, but I think what it says is thou shalt, and maybe it's uh, thou uh, shalt. I, I can read you, uh, it, it, Rule 6 allows a defendant to file a motion for a stay of execution of sentence, quote, with the clerk of the appellate court to which the appeal is being taken. Um, and then there's provided that if the court is the Supreme Judicial Court, the motion shall be filed with the clerk of the Supreme Judicial Court for Suffolk County, unquote. Um, either party uh, may appeal the order of the single justice allowing or denying this day, quote, to the appellate court in which the appeal is pending. So uh, I think that what the... Uh, I have it now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so go ahead, now, now that you have it. Yeah, and I think that this fits right within that plain language. I think it's very... It's very sensible, and it's very clear, and it's exactly what we did. Well, we what about, couldn't come what about here. taken and pending? I mean, you know, so uh, the... Well, I think, uh, it was, you know... It was originally taken in the appeals court, so that's... Well, but it's taken... W w once we file our uh, petition for direct appellate review and the court allows it, we're now taking an appeal to this court. Uh, so I don't think there's anything in that word that precludes what we're doing here. Um, <clears throat> I think this is the only sensible way to read it, the only sensible way to do it. In, in any event, if, if it was here on an appeal from Justice Fecto, what we have is a pure question of law. I mean, there's no, there was no issue about the security factors in front, uh, uh, below, in front of Justice Fecto. He was, although he didn't give a reason, it's clear that he was reviewing the substantiality of the appeal. Well, this court now has that under all the court's case law is a pure question of law. And the question of law is whether the issues presented in this case present an issue worthy of presentation to an appellate court. And I think if we're shown anything, we're shown that these are issues that are worthy of presentation to the appeals court and this court. And therefore, uh, Justice Fecto was in error as a matter of law. So even under the Commonwealth's view, this stay was rightly granted by Justice Spina. Thank you, Councilor. <clears throat>